Good afternoon, everybody. Great to see, see you, so many of you here. Uh, and uh, welcome to the second of this COVID lockdown series of Global Health Compound Design webinars. Uh, and this afternoon's speaker is Al Dossiter from Medchemica, who is, uh, comes with a great title, In Silico Drug Design, What to Do and What Not to Do. Subtitled, We Are All Victims of Our Own History. Uh, if you would like to ask questions during the meeting, please use the Q&A box, which is uh, on the menu bar. You can see, uh, and uh, we'll try and get as many of them answered as possible. Uh, we'll probably wait to the end until we ask the questions. And uh, for those of you who'd like to know about upcoming sessions, the next speaker will be our own Mark Gardner, who will be uh, talking about the discovery of a potential new treatment for schistosomiasis uh, next week, same time slot. Um, and this is the work which is a collaboration between uh, Salvensis and the uh, London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. So while you're having a look at that, I will introduce Al. Al uh, is a good friend of mine and he gained his PhD from Nottingham University and uh, then did a postdoc at Harvard University. He joined AstraZeneca in the UK uh, and has over 20 years of drug discovery experience using in silico techniques, including 13 years at AstraZeneca, um, spread across oncology, inflammation and diabetes areas. In 2012, he co-founded Medchemica Limited to use match molecular pair analysis to accelerate medicinal chemistry. And Al always says that his aim is to create the tools that he wanted when he was working in the labs at AZ. And today, he's gonna to give us the benefit of his experience in drug discovery in his talk. And I'll hand over to him now. Over to you, Al. Uh, you thank you very much, Caroline. I have to uh, stop sharing my screen, don't I? Yeah, yep, there you go. There we go. Uh, Right, lovely. Right, okay, so uh, hopefully you see my introduction slide here, uh, Medchemica at the top and May 2020 down the bottom. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak uh, on this uh, webinar today. Uh, thank you for the organisers uh, for the opportunity. Uh, thank you, Caroline, for a very uh, kind introduction. Um, on the front here uh, is some ways of following us at Medchemica. And although it says the slides uh, set uh, is available on SlideShare, I haven't uh, uploaded them just uh, yet, but I will do shortly after uh, this talk. So uh, there's several other slide decks on there if you want to peruse through uh, some of those, most of them related to match molecular pair analysis. Um, uh, given we are in this uh, lockdown situation, you can also follow the COVID Moonshot project, which is a multi um, unit. Uh, effort uh, looking at the SARS-CoV-2 protease uh, and it does have uh, small molecule inhibitors uh, they're in the weak micromolar stage it's a very open project you can contribute um, designs uh, if you want to I am led to believe there's some brand new data that came out just yesterday as well uh, so uh, follow us there on Twitter if you can we, we contribute to this pro bono at the moment uh, in this presentation, there are a lot of references, and uh, we maintain our website a thing called bucket list papers. Uh, so we 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 add to these uh, one or two every month. We've we've had a couple of months off from from loading up some suggestions, but we think these are the 100 uh, medicinal chemistry, comp chemistry, in silico design papers that you've got to read before uh, you leave the industry, shall we say? Um, so bit of fun there, um, love them, hate them, disagree with this. Um, just because they're on that list doesn't mean they'll be the best paper, by the way. There might be some other ways we might say, uh, we don't think you should do an analysis like this. But anyway, uh, also follow us on, on bucket list papers. Um, so um, for today, I'm going to talk about why we do uh, in silico drug design. Uh, and it's impossible for me to cover uh, that in 50 minutes hence the idea about this is what to do not to do and this is this is what to do and uh, that comes from my personal experience having been caught in some traps 
um, and, and, and finding solutions to things the hard way, basically. So hopefully I've got a few uh, life lessons I can kind of pass on to you. Um, so there's the problem statement and we're going to talk about where do ideas come from us uh, as chemists trying to move forward drug discovery projects. And first of all, I'm going to talk about analytics and the power of getting enough uh, information and really looking at what you already have before you even think about design. In the 2D methods, um, I really want to impart about how molecules are built and what their limitations are in, in, in in silico design. And I'm going to use the example of ALOP98 because one way or another, you all use calculator log P uh, going forward. But I'll briefly cover some of the other methods uh, and, and briefly cover match molecular pair analysis, which is what we do, and make some comments about artificial intelligence as well. For the purposes of structure based design and 3D molecular design, Again, a whole lot of, of methods uh, that could be used today. I'm not an expert on, on all of them uh, by any means. It's sort of jack of all trades is what I would I'd like to say on, on a lot of these things. But a lot of the 3D model I'm going to illustrate in two project examples, Cathepsin K and 11B Dredges D. Hopefully this goes well, we should spend uh, more than half the time on, on the two projects. And then I'll bring that together in the uh, what to do, what not to do, and hopefully leave us seven or eight minutes uh, for, for questions. Um, so too, too much to talk about in 50 minutes. Uh, I don't have to dwell on this one because Caroline's already given us um, a very good uh, introduction. And um, she, she mentioned there about uh, finally getting the tools I always wanted to do as a, as a drug designer. We now have those tools. Um, it's only taken eight years for us to produce them and there's, there's more coming on. That's a different kettle of fish asking about what we do. And the quote was taken out there, we're all victims of our own, own history. So I, I do want to re-emphasize that. You might disagree with some of the things I say here. That's absolutely fine. That's what science should be about. We should be, all, all methods should be up for challenge. We all, all methods have uh, some kind of shortcomings to it. And so I, I just reiterating, I'm talking from uh, the, my last 20 years of experience uh, in, the, in the industry. Um, that's a picture of me rock climbing. I've not been out rock climbing since uh, lockdown uh, began. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to the day that, that I do. But we focus on the things that we can do. Uh, for those of you around the world, this is a, a particular lovely piece of rock in the north of England. Uh, you can tell it's in the north of England because the sky's grey. Um, so what are we all about? Uh, if you've not read this paper, this is a great paper uh, to read from 2012. So it's a little bit dated, but the points in it are still the same. Early on in the history of drug discovery, um, it is thought uh, there was a whole realm of uh, biological targets to go for in, in the body uh, because drug discovery was, was a new thing. It's more difficult to discover uh, drugs at the moment. Uh, essentially because of a, a set of problems. Um, you've got to be better than all ordinary drugs out there. The regulator wants to have the safest drugs as pro uh, possible. And, and out of coming from this, uh, during the noughties, there was a period where the pharma industry as a whole, particularly a large pharma, when if we just make lots and lots of compounds, we'll get there. And that we'll, the more projects we do and the more compounds we make, the more drugs that will come out of the, the other end of it. And it was a brute force approach and it was a throw money at it approach and it didn't really work at all. So coupled with this concept of the easy targets have gone and it's got uh, really difficult, a decline in, in the industry. We have seen in the last couple of years an upsurge in the uh, number of drugs approved by regulators in the end. And the thing is about the low hanging fruit problem is once we've actually worked out how to target a particular uh, uh, area and we do have small molecule leads, suddenly the, the, the back of it's broken and we an, an outcome a suite of drugs that come from it. Um, so uh, the point of this is, is this throw money and brute force thing has, has kind of gone and we've, we're returning to really thinking about what we're doing. And this is where in silico drug discovery comes in. Here are some quotes from some of our, our clients that we work for, uh, not in kind of the, the days of big pharma as well, but 
there is this realization that we need to do li and lo now back in hundreds of compounds and we need to leverage the power that we've got in the data sets that we have uh, the power of computers and, and the power of us as human beings to be creative to do fewer design make test analyze cycles and make fewer compounds and, and med chemical is one of those companies where we're building expert systems that suggest actions to chemists and works with chemists to say how about how about making this uh, the easiest way to explain it is if you go on to um every time you log on to amazon and it says hey people that bought these also bought these and our software that goes well people that tried to uh, had compounds like yours fixed the metabolism by making these compounds that's an, an easy way to kind of explain it um so we should be in the problem statements using in silico techniques to analyze rigorously where we are and refine our de designs and get to a much much better candidate drug in fewer iterations the more quality shots we have on goal the more we, we're less prone to be um full victim of phase one and phase two failures uh where they are particularly around the, the validation of, of targets uh, and the more we can kind of do that, the more works and the more drugs and will come out of it. So there we go. Where do ideas come from? How do we, how do we think of the next thing uh, to make? And the point I want to make it here is about rigorous analysis and cover a few techniques. So I've said this kind of already. If you're familiar with the design, make, test, analyze cycle and this iterative cycle. And the point about in silico drug discovery is not just at the design stage, it's at the analyze stage. And it's these days with multi-dimensional data, it's too much for us to take in. So we want to leverage the power of a computer. This is built just to deal with numbers to help turn over that data and start to see and, and see patterns and really understand where we are to make much better design decisions going forward. Uh, and hence out of this process and this been able to focus, our ideas are going to be much better out of it. I could talk, talk a lot about the design, make, test, analyze cycle. Here's a whole bunch of for you to uh, references for you to read about improving that that process, um, with some quite controversial papers like uh, lead optimization in 12 months. This was quite a big deal when it came out that bottom paper. But essentially, a, a lot of the results in these papers were were uh, came about by increased clarity effective communication once projects have worked out what they were really trying to do moving forward but as i said already to be able to get structure activity relationships to our compounds to even get a good idea of what to make next we have a plethora of information sources to come in that that, that move us and push us uh, in kind of different directions um, there is a, a great wealth of information and patterns and publications and getting that onto the computer now has been a, is a lot easier more easy than it, it was before we're always thinking about can we actually make these compounds and, and one way or another even though it's come and go in fashion um the the, the things like making large libraries and compounds and, and uh, have come back around again with things like dna encoded libraries uh, but our, our capacity to be able to hold data and an analyze data and, and, uh, and bring this to bear is, is much better than it used to be. Uh, and so again, just to kind of almost layer this, we are human beings. And one of, a great piece of advice I want to say is understand thyself and understand the biases that we can undergo. And one of the great joys of using in silico design is it's unbiased. In what it does uh, one of the things that uh, i've always seen over the years is what's called recency bias where this project just over here has done really well and they did this kind of thing and then people don't feel under time and pressure to kind of do the same trick and see if that works and that might not necessarily be appropriate for your uh, uh, for, for your particular target uh, we're very susceptible to the latest thing and the latest new technology, which is in itself is an irony for in silico drug design. So the most successful medicinal chemists I know are those that go and really analyze the data they have at the moment. And nearly all of them in a particular area 
and a particular field of protein clusters and particular sets of compounds go out and, and extract as much knowledge as they can out of the patent literature. And we are blessed in, in recent years in that um, uh, many of the patent offices around uh, the, the world are demanding data inside the patent to justify the claims and justify the SAR claim. So we actually have can do SAO analysis on data. I'll just show you two examples from back in the day. These are two of one of the early kinase inhibitors for, uh, for EGFR. Uh, just a handful of compounds. There, if you go and look at this, there were there was days between the publications of these, these two patterns. And the types of sort of things we can do now is to look at the relationships between all the compounds uh, in those patterns and show how they actually connect together. The light green and the dark green at the top are all the compounds from one pattern. And there's an arrow pointing to where the candidate drugs are in both, both patterns. And there's about six degrees of uh, separation between the actual uh, compounds by this type of, uh, of graph analysis. And we can use these to help us cluster the compounds together and get and extract the SAR information. This is a very high level view of our recent uh, GPCR target that we did uh, for a client where not only we took all the patent data, but for all the literature data, identified the pivotal compounds in an unbiased fashion by getting the computer to do it. Um, generating uh, machine learning models to predict potency out of this. And very importantly, identifying critical fragments. And that's what this yellow blob is uh, just here. Uh, now, if you are skilled and you are, you, you, we are humans and we're brilliant at spotting data, you can go through patterns and pick these things out. The point I'm trying to make here is with this type of analysis using a computer, it confirms in an unbiased manner that these fragments here are critical to activity in these types of protein targets. And what these people were able to do was to start a new project of, uh, in this particular GPC, uh, GPCR area and be able to predict potency. and achieve that idea of, of, of uh, fewer compound designs going in. So uh, how do we do all this kind of SAR analysis? So let's talk about models. And I'm gonna show you in the project examples, um, two, uh, in the two project examples, where both used free will some analysis. And this is, you could say is as old as the ills. 1964 was the publication from uh the, these two chemists and what they said basically is you can work out the fragment contribution of groups in a molecule and from these contributions if you uh design a new compound using fragments of these compounds that hasn't been made yet you've got a good chance of predicting what the potency of that is uh, by adding up these fragment contributions. That, of course, makes sense to us from structure activity uh, relationships. Um, and, and honestly, it's one of the most uh, useful methods uh, that I've used over the years. So that's a first learning there. Always be doing free Wilson analysis and do it on a regular basis on your project. I did just cut and paste a couple of the bits straight out of the paper. If you want a more recent assessment to this, and this is about additive and non-additive effects, because the assumption here is that all of the contributions will add up, and um, that's not always the case, because it's biology. Uh, recent paper from Gillett and Willett. Uh, you can do this in a modern setting. You can all automate this. We do this with matched molecular pair analysis. We call this permutative matched molecular pair analysis. Uh, and it takes into uh, account a much larger portion of the environment of the molecule. So it means that you get contributions to the group that are much more specific to where they are. And that means it's less susceptible to non-additive effects. And what we're talking about here, so you take a data set, this is illustrated here, and you have a pairs of molecules and they change by the same uh, into conversion. Let's say this is hydrogen turning into chlorine. It's a very specific group uh, position in the molecule and an aromatic ring. We then have a compound M5 that has never had that transformation applied to it. Because of this change in potency, if we apply that, we should get a new molecule out and we have a chance, good chance of predicting what its potency is. This is a, this is a, a real life example here, again, one we've done for a client. And this is the holy grail of reduction in lipophilicity and increase in potency. Uh, plotted out of this, we came out with a set of combinations of groups that had not yet been made. 
uh, that were predicted to have uh, good potency based on these groups. And you can also do this by bringing in the pattern data as well. So a point out of all of this is that uh, those chemists I know really make the data they already have, analyze it in an unbiased ma manner, and using things like three wheels to make sure there are not any combinations of groups that haven't yet been already made. So 2D and 3D design. More techniques than we have a day for if we have an entire conference. Um, I've talked about, uh, I'm going to briefly talk a bit more about quantitative structure activity relationships with the example of ALOL P98, briefly talk about match pairs and, and machine learning, and then start to go on to the 3D technology, uh, 3D technology uh, techniques by doing the project examples. Um, I'm not, um, I, I can do docking, but I'm not a, a, an expert on fully on the algorithms. If you really want to know that, go and get a, a kind of expert on it. I'm going to throw in some protein and, and ligand structure and torsional analysis. Force fields and simulations and things like free energy perturbation. I would get a company like Crescent or somebody from Relay Therapeutics or um, somebody from Schrodinger to come and talk about this. Uh, if you want to know about quantum mechanical methods, although I'm going to chuck in a couple of these, um, uh, Andrew Leach at the University of Manchester is a great um, uh, speaker to have. Uh, and I would say the leaders in molecular dynamics due to the compute techniques and um, very, very good set of silent, uh, scientists at Pat Walters at Relay Therapeutics uh, based in Boston. So 2D techniques are all about predictions. And we say they're 2Ds because they just look at the uh, molecule without any consideration to its three-dimensional structure. It's a very crude way of, of defining it. The only message I want to tell you is by having appreciation of how the models are built, we have an appreciation of their errors and the weight that we put behind any prediction we get out. And that is important in our decision-making to go forward. Uh, in designing a compass. Uh, but we have a lot to expect of our drug uh, candidates going forward. We used to just think about potency, 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 but now we need to think about solubility and metabolism and safety and, and, and all the rest of it. Uh, and so everybody wants high quality models that are really accurate in predicting. And that's, that's whether you're doing it by qualitative structure activity relationships, or you're doing it by machine learning, that is essentially the same problem that we've been trying to do for about 25 years now. Uh, the above compound there is one of a glucokinase inhibitor project. Uh, there's the reference for it from, from White Road. Some nice little bits of match method pair analysis in that one. What we've typically done is done pr produce models like this, which are really vague, which is, oh, HERG inhibitors are a nitrogen that tends to be basic with some link at X to an aromatic ring. Well, I can tell you that's more than half the compounds in the Kemble database, basically. And as a predictor, it's only kind of a factor of two better than it not being in the group as well. This thing's got an odds ratio kind of going forward. And you can find that motive in, in plenty of drugs that are, are not particular potency inhibitors of ERG uh, and are known drugs on the market. So we need things that are better than that one going forward. So to talk about uh, how we do better with ERG and talk about illustrations, I'm going to focus on lipophilicity. I have a long running track record of, of um, saying it's not just all about lipophilicity, it's all about structure as well. So that's my general introduction slide. The great thing is, if you use C log P in making the decision, give yourself a pat on the back for doing in silico drug design because that's what you're doing. You're using log, log P to help guide your drug design. However, uh, log P is not a panacea for fixing all of your problems. Uh, I direct you to this uh, excellent review, um, an expert opinion in drug discovery, again from Mike Weary in 2020. And he brought together a, a, uh, many of the papers from modeling that have been over the previous 10 years. And basically what they said, if you're very lipophilic and you're very polar and you want an orally bioavailable drug, don't be too late, don't be either too polar or very lipophilic or you kind of run into problems. Uh, and this is directly out of this paper to say this is the sweet spot in the middle. What these say is very important is whilst that holds true, don't be very lipophilic, uh, don't be very polar, you want to be safe and orally bioavailable. 
that is not the same as reducing lipophilicity fixes all your problems. And there's a quote from Pete Kenny as well, if you and another interesting paper, and I'm sure you've you've read that that by now. And many a time I have been on a project where I've been in the sweet spot in the middle and still had problems with my compounds. And all reducing lipophilicity is going to do is give you a very polar molecule and probably no bioavailability and high clearance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So important lipophilicity, but it's not everything. Back to analysis and quality analysis. One thing that happens with our tools is that they have a tendency to plot uh, and fill the square on the screen uh, with the spots and uh, the data points that you have. Um, what this tends to do is then you go, oh, look, I've got a relationship because the line I can draw through it is at an angle of 45 degrees. These are three plots straight out of the literature. Uh, one of them is from my paper or a paper that I produced a while ago. Uh, and I'm illustrating the fact that I have fallen uh, victim to this, uh, to this as well. And it's very easy to say you have a relationship. But if you look at the slope of the line, and I'll bring your attention to the, the one in the middle, the slope of this line is 0.16. So if you want a tenfold change in 3A4 inhibition, you need to drop six log units in lipophilicity. There is a relationship there. It is weak. It is not necessarily causal, but it's not strong. And, uh, and so I can impart into you, really spread your axes out so they're the same size. So the one on the right, it's only uh, basically a little more than a log unit in delta change in human liver microsomes, but there are several log units across the bottom axis, five log units. So that should be plotted five log units against five log units. If you look at it then, it's a very flat line. The slope of the line is there is 0.33 and the Herg one on the right is 0.3 as well. So remember when you're in a Herg situation and you want, only want a tenfold improvement, that could cost you, it could require a drop in three log units of lipophilicity to do it. And that is a hard thing to do. And that is a trap that's easy to fall into in, in lipophilicity. Uh, this is another type of analysis being done. Don't in any way of shape do your analysis like this. Uh, this is one that I've done and I'll illustrate the point here. Binning your data. So this is a whole set of uh, SIP inhibition data up to 2003, 1400 data points. Count of the number of compounds in each box. So in the top right hand compounds, top right hand corner, large compounds and lipophilic compounds. Oh, look, the 86% of them are less than 10 micromolar SIP inhibition inhibitors. So it tends to fit into this thing about don't be too large and don't be too lipophilic. If you take the next three years of data, 1700 points, uh, data points, the relationship disappears and it's not statistically significant. And this is what binning can do. Always plot your data on two continuous linear scales and look at it in a raw sense. If you did do this data, you'd find it's a big blob in the middle like this and chopping it into four doesn't make any sense whatsoever. I bring your attention to a paper called Inflation of Cor uh, Correlation by Pete Kenny, which shows how many analyses have been done over the year that have inflated a correlation uh, due to this binning effect. So don't do it. So appreciating QSAR models, having talked about uh, quality analysis going, going forward, and it does feed into these type of analyses going forward. Essentially, uh, CLLP models are built by looking at breaking a molecule down into its functional groups, like the Free Wilson saying, that group will make this contribution in lipophilicity. If you add them all up, you get a prediction of lipophilicity with an error. But each one of these contributing groups, and again, this is straight out of the ALOP P98 publication, has an error attached to it. There are 27 different types of carbon atom, for example, and each one has an error. So by the time you add the thing up, this prediction of 0.14 could be plus or minus half a log unit. So when we come to plot our data and when we come to do things like, like binning, we are working with a, a, a prediction that inherently has errors going forward. And that is the same for all, all predictions. It may be better in many circumstances to look at the range that you have on a prediction and look at how good a fit it is. 
because all of these models are only as good as the data set that built them. The good news is, is that the, many people on CLLP continually take data out of the literature and continually update the models and find situations where a particular group um, does not uh, predict very well. And that's because the environment's in that's changed. So this 27 atoms could become 28 and 29. Um, ALLP 98, we do use this one because it's actually quite good uh, and it's based on atom contributions as you've probably gathered by now. Uh, but do have an appreciation, the last point there, intramolecular hydrogen bonds could often mask polar groups and, and it's things like this that, 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 that put us out in some way or other. Again, another one we're not great at doing is pKa prediction. There's not enough measured pKa's out there. And, it is difficult because it's very dependent on the uh, on what on the um, on the hydration of the compound, the availability of the groups, um, and even before you go to that that level, um, it, it, we build a lot of models by finding structural groups in molecules, like identifying the acid, identifying hydrogen bond donors and acceptors. And to do this, we write smart patterns to find that stru substructural unit. Depending on the toolkit you use, these may or may not be right. Uh, the top one, this, this was from uh, quite recently, only last year. That's DMAP at the top, and, it, and it's uh, with the identifiers for hydrogen bond acceptors, it's saying that the, the nitrogen with two methyls is an acceptor on it. So, Amazingly, when we built machine learning models, we had to produce our own set of descriptors for this, which, which surprised us to, uh, to a degree. On building models, here are two great papers to read about how not to do it and, um, uh, and uh, um, some discussions on, on why QSAR has uh, fall short sometimes. But nonetheless, life's getting better and better. A brief word about AI and medicinal chemistry. We do have a challenge in AI. Um, fully documented discovery projects are in short sort of life when it comes when it comes to it. Uh, people can build great AI, AI uh, computer models because you can actually get two computers to play each other at a game like AlphaGo, and their computers can learn off each other very quickly. It's a very long time period in discovery to get the result out that we want, which is a drug to market. Uh, and so this presents kind of uh, quite a challenge. And, and, and on the way there, it's very difficult to predict. Uh, it's unclear whether we're successful or not. And as time's gone on, we've discovered more and more that data diversity is, is, an, is an issue. You might have a million data points, but they're the same kind of chemical groups that have been measured. And we don't have enough data points across a whole broad set of things that we can measure like solubility metabolism and, and all the rest of it to build effective models uh, and in short we're quite good at predicting small changes around a benzene ring but not necessarily partic particularly good uh, at predicting all the effects of a basic group or polar groups dotted around around molecules um, however you you can do uh, reasonably well at this but by thinking in a different way we all, uh, as I said, can do predictions and have an error that goes with it. But one of the more useful things you can do is actually show the features in a molecule uh, going forward. And to actually show the features and, and, and how the prediction is built up, like it was in the LLP, you can actually provide quite useful information to show you how these contributing groups uh, uh, come to do it. And as chemists designing molecules, uh, we put forward this is actually in some ways more useful than actually the prediction of 7 point PRC50 or 7.7 is to actually know it, the basic nitrogen, how much contribution does that make and actually how much contribution does this interesting uh, polar group at the other end make as well because that's more informative to our decision and that helps us to stop worrying about the exact uh, precision of the, the prediction going forward. Uh, we use matched molecular pair analysis. This is a process of comparing molecules uh, going forward and cataloging uh, the changes between them. This is the addition of CH2OH and the effect it has on solubility. Here are three match pairs, all, all have the addition of the CH2OH to them. The all increase solubility, median increase in 1.6 uh, log units. If we take six match pairs, 
that all share the same chemical transformation, but a nice diversity of molecules. And they all improve solubility. We can say that improves solubility. That is the basis of our, as it were, our medicinal chemistry uh, bag of tricks. Uh, we actually have 69 pairs like this on our database, and uh, it is a rule for increasing solubility. It does, we have data sets for HERG as well and metabolism things. Once you've encoded this transformation, if you get another molecule up and you know the environment of this transformation and people say give me ideas to improve solubility you can apply this transformation and say hey here are the examples of where this came from these are backed up because in this case they are at Kenmore and you can look these up in the literature and you can look at real measured values here so that's our system essentially for suggesting molecules to chemists and where they come from and the idea is is that uh, it's, it's a bit like the uh, uh, Shibaya crossing in Tokyo. Uh, why would you go around the outside when you can go straight across the middle, basically? The idea of getting just a few iterations is whilst you could take a uh, T-butyl group and you happen to have had the CH2 hydroxy compound and we could try extending this further, we can make this less lipophilic, see if that improves solubility as well or metabolism. Wouldn't it be great to know that you can go straight from the T-butyl group to this methyl uh, hydroxy group over here? And so do transformation D in one step uh, going forward. And the great thing about doing this, if you do this with a computer, it will match up these compounds for you in an unbiased way and catalog all these things. Even if that back in the day, that wasn't what people were quite thinking of. So that was a whirlwind tour of, of 2D molecular design and I hope I imparted some ideas about understanding how models are built, understanding their shortcomings and by getting underneath the hood of how these models are built in whatever method you're using, we can actually use the methodology of how they're built to help influence us and get ideas to, to, to move forward. So hopefully now, oh, time is moving on, I shall quickly do a couple of project examples. Uh, so, cathepsin K, um, uh, serine protease, uh, we did have uh, reversible covalent binders and we're blessed with a very uh, potent inhibitor out there, but it fell uh, short on selectivity and things like metabolism. We did a very rare thing, I don't, I don't see this often done in projects and as consultants we do this quite a lot. Uh, we recommend stripping compounds back. And the first compound we actually made is we stripped the core back to just the electrophilic nitrile group here and the chiral 1 2 uh, cyclohexyl group and straight dimethylamide. Knowing full well this would probably make a less selective compound. But as a result, and this is really important, having a handful of really simple compounds really grounds your in silico predictions. It makes the model so much better by doing this. In this case, it gave us this kind of 300 nanomolar compound that was well, LE, LLE, much debated about uh, simple calculation you could do that describes the efficiency of your compounds. Let's just focus on getting the most out of every atom in your compound. It showed us that the compound was, was quite good. It was very polar as well. So it was uh, at the limit of the log D assay when measured minus uh, 0.5. And then we rebuilt the compound up with some pretty straightforward groups, again, understanding where we were. Then came along some, uh, some structural information, and it was very good to be able to get crystal structures of these compounds. They were covalent binders, so they... Uh, the uh, binding to the uh, cysteine group was down this end of the molecule and we mostly could focus on the p3 binding groove over here the cyclohexyl was an excellent fit into these pockets with good surface contacts in these now then this was the naughties we were under incredible pressure to make a lot of compounds you could go on the computer and enumerate 1200 uh, uh, secondary amines on this one but what was the point we had wonderful information here we could take these simple molecules and minimize their structures three-dimensionally and apply quantum mechanical models to these. And it fairly well predicted this shape motif here. So I think we only got about eight or nine crystal structures on the, on the project because we were very confident, and yes, the covalent binder helped us, that we could actually predict how these, how these could bind by 
essentially what you do is you lock the covalent binder and you wiggle the compound in, and wiggle the cyclohexyl in. Uh, and so we could focus on the surface contacts here, uh, kind of moving forward. Uh, so that was great. So we pushed back against making lost compounds and said, we're actually going to be really focused here. Uh, and there was a wonderful tyrosine group just here. And we thought, hey, can we wrap the compounds around this and maximize the surface contacts here? And I've put on this paper, uh, uh, on this slide here, a couple of paper references on your must read. We've got bucket list papers, uh, a, a guide to molecular interactions and thinking about uh, what are edge face interactions with aromatics in this case and optimizing hydrogen bond uh, distances. I must say, actually, I've never successfully optimized uh, an electrostatic inf uh, uh, interaction, a hydrogen bond. You usually get them or you don't. Uh, most of the time what we're doing is, is kind of messing uh, about filling space up. That's my personal kind of experience. Alan. But uh, structure-based design is, is a very, very powerful way forward, but it also has some problems with it as well. And uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I put the structure of biotin uh, bound into streptavidin because it's the most stunningly efficient binder as well. Uh, these, these interactions are, are near perfect and it fits absolutely beautifully, which is why it's used so much in, um, uh, and, and driven us forward in molecular biology. Um, the bottom two references here is, is, is kind of do's and don'ts when using structural based uh, design and I urge you to read those. I only want to impart really one important lesson here. Sit down with your crystallographers, resolve the structure and look at the electron density. And the reason being is once you put the electron density, so this is actually the resolved information from the x-ray diffraction going forward, you get blobs and the job to do is to fit this into the structure kind of going forward. So this left hand one is the steroid blob. Well, I suppose it goes in that way. Um, it probably fits the other way to some degree. So remember, this is what we're working on, this electron density going forward. You can see some wobble in some of the, the, these, uh, these leucine groups over here. Um, there's some electron density around this water molecule here. Once you start looking at these, you suddenly realise, okay, how much weight am I going to kind of put behind this, this crystal structure going forward? I urge you to do this. Uh, in this particular compound, it, it, which way around is this, this group over here? Um, I've known a lot of people on a lot of projects go, this is definitely this, and we're going to add this group on here, and it's going to interact with this, and so on and so forth, and it doesn't work out whatsoever. And when the people have come back to and got a more refined crystal structure later on, they find the groups aren't where they are. Uh, and, and sometimes it comes down to guesswork going forward. So that's the lesson there, electron density. This project, uh, I'm going to go at speed now. Uh, this project, we did a free Wilson analysis of the combinations of group. And uh, after that initial set of eight or nine compounds, we just made 54 compounds. And we could eliminate a couple of head groups out of this from the further expansion. And we very quickly identified a couple of potent series to kind of move forward. Um, we planned 60, it took three weeks to work. The entire chemistry team worked on this golden very, very quickly. And we got uh, data on selectivity and uh, in vitro uh, DMPK assays and RAT-PK on 10 compounds. And as a result of this, we had very, very good models going forward and we could build these into, Asia, into AstraZeneca's uh, log D uh, prediction models. So we're very confident, again, with Hergen solubility predictions. In short, uh, this was the first route. So there's the hit, there's the cut down compound. Uh, this compound on the top right, we seriously looked at this as a potential candidate drug that came out of that first matrix going forward. We took the piperazines and the carbolines going forward. Carbolines is very, very potent, but higher metabolism. And the structural fix in the end is we realized from that crystal structure that this bit at the bottom was probably fairly optimal. We did like the fluorine for a little while. Uh, but actually over here, we could uh, do work with um, uh, modifying groups to potentially look at metabolism and see if we could shift the, the, the properties kind of going forward. And it was a methoxy group that, that won out in the end, which might surprise you. It's another story over there. Uh, what effect it has on shielding that hydrogen bond donor debate. Uh, all of them are solvated uh, kind of going forward. 
uh, but that gave us the candidate drug, which was AZD4996. Um, the compounds fairly well uh, uh, fell in the log D range that was good. Um, CD2, just a very quick story of structural based design here and matched molecular pair analysis. Um, that sulfone was very good, but high renal clearance. And um, we did like the cyclopropyl, better, certainly better for, for solubility, big increase in lipid felicity, other things uh, kind of went worse. But the matched molecular pair analysis told us that we could use 1,2-dimethoxy, which is again the group that surprised people. But I guess we'd come out with uh, the realisation that, um, uh, that maybe methoxys were good in this kind of project. But this was a breakthrough. Uh, from henceforth, we had high bioavailability, low clearance uh, across species, and it was fantastic. If I asked you from a VESPA modeling point of view and in silico drug discovery what the shape of 1,2-dimethoxy you'd be forgiven for thinking that it was this shape maybe one of these out of the plane and that the groups would repel each other these electrons in here would repel each other it's not it's actually this shape this is a great useful thing to do in, in silico drug discovery design go to the protein data bank go to cambridge crystallographic data center and small molecules and search out the group you're looking for they're quite often in there 97 percent of structures and we're talking 500 structures here show that one two dimethoxy the methyl groups are in plane and pointing out from each other the electrons point towards each other whoa what is that about now we know that information, we can look at that further with quantum mechanical methods and actually find there is an interaction between the two groups. And you get a site of electropotential minimum here about the strength of a nitrogen lone pair. OK, so that's the shape. Now we surmise that this is a shape effect, not um, a lipophilicity effect. And by doing that and knowing it's a lone pair, you can design things like this. Uh, there's a whole story about this methyl group that I haven't got uh, time for as well. I'll briefly talk about it because there is some structural uh, design to it as well. Anyway, dose estimation from one mega kig down to point uh, per, to uh, point zero one mega kig, very high bioavailability, super stable. We had to prolong the uh, incubation in microzones to actually try and get a number out of this one, and we've done all of that by increasing lipophilicity. Uh, the methyl group is really interesting. We could actually get the methyl group pointing towards this tyrosine as well, because methyl groups next to an amide, and you can't model this really effectively, go axial on a ring. Didn't know that. Be surprised. Be prepared to be surprised. Uh, that's a whole bunch of the compounds and the profiles of candidate drugs. Chairperson, how am I doing for time? I have 12 minutes left on my clock. Um, I can go on to the 11 Beach Retricity project or take questions. You point. have 12 minutes left on my clock too. Um, what do we reckon? I think you've got quite a lot of useful stuff there for people to talk through, to discuss. Yep, so happy. I can do a very two minute on Beach Retricity because we're going to make... Go on, do a two minute that. because we're going to take want to see what Fred's been up to. Uh, brilliant structure based design project this fantastic structures again the, showing that electron density was everything uh, i joined the project on what was going to be cd3 um, it was about reducing appetite by uh, producing a cns penetrant compounds uh, going forward uh, to increase target engagement and produce a, a larger effect there's references for uh, producing CNS penetrant compounds, smaller compounds. And uh, as time's gone on, one of the two critical ind uh, indicators are usually total per perla surface area. And using MDC e efflux uh, as, a, uh, as a marker, if you don't have efflux, you tend, tend to kind of be able to get into the brain because it's, uh, the blood brain barrier is a transportation system, Ugh, loosely. Um, some good references there. Um, so uh, the project went about to find uh, new cores that were more CNS penetrant. And this compound on the left, uh, we spotted by reanalyzing all the data that we had. So back to my first point about really understanding where you were. And this core here gave us an idea that we might be able to get a smaller compound, a more efficient compound this and get into and do something about masking that hydrogen bond donor that we had there. 
that would kind of mask some of the polar surface area that we had. You can do that with this series. That's a nice bit of ab initio calculation that you could do to show you that one. We didn't progress that uh, particular series through. I've got a whole bunch of things that essentially say plotting two things on a continuous scale there. The, the cutoff for, for polar surface area is much more uh, um, clear in terms of brain to blood ratio uh, and, and using a marker of topo polo, polo, uh, topological sorry, polar surface area. No relationship to lipophilicity whatsoever with clearance. Um, and so here's some of the 2D design that we had and some of the crystal structures going forward. Uh, we got a lot of crystal structures here, but quite often there's some electron density on this structure here. There was, there was some ambiguity in some of the groups. I hope you can see in this group here that it wasn't really uh, showing density for this group very well. So when we came to think about interacting to get the best selectivity we could across species, to enable us to do high quality uh, in vivo models. Um, this idea of uh, interacting with this AS group was actually rather vague, uh, but nonetheless, once we understood this better about the structures, we knew where to put an oxygen group and what kind of distance going forward. What we could also do in, in silico is to look at the energy and the rotational groups around here. And this is very important. Uh, and the, the summary of this one is, uh, the favorable interaction with this new thiazole core and the group over there came up because the rotation of these, these uh, cyclobrupil, cyclopropyl and THF groups was at an energy minimum, one of several energy minima out there. Always be thinking about this, always pause with the molecules and look at where the energy minimum. We're then able to do a free Wilson analysis, that was a lot of that one there, and that gave us a brilliant shortlist of compounds. It's all published, you can read it all. Uh, your ledger had some fantastic le uh, low doses and uh, we finished the project by doing uh, an in vivo study and there was no additional benefit of getting this CNS in, uh, exposure uh, there was not a lot of difference in body weight reduction so the project stopped at that point and, and we published the results on this slide here is the conclusions of my talk we are doing in silico to reduce the number of compound designs and get ourselves to quality more more quickly. Um, make sure you understand the uh, uh, the data you already have. Do quality analysis. Plot things only two D plots on a continuous scale. I think I've said that enough times already. Free Wilson is often a winning technique for moving forward. Make sure you've made all the combinations of compounds. You might be surprised at it understand how the models are built often understanding how they're built provides more information to go forward and i hope to illustrate that with alop 98 remember your model's only good as the data set synthesizing and testing extensively simple molecules often baselines your compound series so you really understand where you are um, 3d designs confirmation analysis and dockings and things have all got kind of errors. I really wanted to impart on there that structural information of show the electron density. I've hopefully said that 10 times by now. Make sure you look at that uh, electron density. Thank you very much. Very happy to take questions. Thanks Al, that was a, a great children of force. Um, if anybody's got any questions, please feel free to type them into the chat box or you can unmute yourself and ask them uh, because I think got space for that. Uh, whilst we're doing that, whilst you're all getting your questions together, uh, I, feel, I think I'll get this, the ball rolling. So you have a, a question, uh, I have a question about PKA. You said there's not enough PKA data out there and by which you mean measured PKAs in water. Right. So that's not actually the PKA you want to know, you want to understand the PKA in the protein phase, don't you? Yeah, indeed. And so that, this is actually quite complicated, indeed. And you've, you've, you've uh, hit the nail on the head there. Um, and, uh, and that can differ as well. The example out there in Cat K is that we would um, was also made more complicated because in the osteoclast cells, which we were targeting, um, try to envisage an osteoclast as a Pac-Man that's munching its way across your bone actually yep. dissolves the bone and replaces it it's actually acidic in that cell to so ph5 and it, and it affects the um 
acidity the protonation state of the cysteine as well so it, it, it is considerably more complicated than that mm. um, there is a great set of volumes of measured uh, pks out of there in water and in, and in other solvents as well uh, and and i'm that has been diligently typed in um, uh, by an XAZ uh, computational chemist. I believe uh, OpenEye have it at the moment. Um, they okay. own that. Um, so there is a reasonable size PK database that's owned by OpenEye. Yes. So, uh, you know, are there any other good resources out there for people not in big pharma companies? Um, um, it, uh, the, I was ordered to defer these out, uh, answers to our Andrew Leach. Uh, <laughs> Uh, which is a kind of way of copying out of of of, of giving the answer to be fair and um as i understand it it'll always come down to a better um a qm calculation but they're always have uh, their problems as well because you start off in the gas phase as well not necessarily kind of in the do you phase. not think that actually the, the patent literature is is a good source of this kind of data that we don't exploit enough um Hmm. I'm trying to think how much I've actually seen in patents. That is a good question. Um, or whether we can infer it from... Um, Not necessarily data. PKA data, but there's quite often solubility data and that kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, so, so my, I was mentally moving on to kind of melting points. Mm. Um, so there's uh, a database um, of uh, melting points has been made, uh, made available by Nextmove and um that's come from extracting um uh, quite literally straight out of recognizing the bracket m dot p dot and degrees uh, c uh, and so they have an extractor set of, of melting points out there so that's uh we have analyzed that with match molecular pair analysis and you can apply that into um solubility predictions mm. uh, as well and uh, we, we've not released that one yet because there's a few foibles in there that we're like need considerable more work basically and i'll leave it at that because okay uh, <laughs> um uh, but, but but to tantalizingly dangle that because of extracting patents you've got melting point data from materials chemistry not necessarily ah, okay. drug discovery or agrochemical uh, uh, setting. And what that means as well is that's extra information that we could potentially use as well um, to the good in there. So, uh, that, that, but yeah, that I'm, I'm sure there's something in there. Uh, if somebody would like to give me money for a postdoc, uh, that'd be great. Can I convince anybody else to put their hand up and ask a question? Go on. I had a question right, right at the beginning of your talk, Al. You had your six degrees of separation network analysis, very oh, yeah. complicated network analysis yeah. for two molecules that, as a chemist, you would look at and say, hmm, these are, these are very close relatives of each other. Yeah. I was surprised that they were six yeah. degrees apart. Yes, that's right. That's how they link through the network, basically, um, of, of matched pairs, basically. Uh, yeah, so it's, um, I, sus I, uh, I suspect we, um, it's a, um, uh, I suspect if we chopped and changed that data set and read it in a different way, we might be able to join them up by fewer degrees of separation. It's, it's taking the whole set together, basically. Anybody else? No, we have a very quiet audience this yeah. afternoon, which is rare. Well, if there are no other questions, I'll draw the meeting to, to a close. Um, I will post the video up on the YouTube channel, so you will be able to check through all the references that Al gave uh, and dig deeper into some of those. And I, and I hope that's useful information for you all, and I hope you enjoyed the talk today. Uh, I did immensely. Thanks very much, Al. Right, cheers. A pleasure. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. <laughs> okay. I'll now close the meeting.